Hi, I'm Carolyn Priester Jones. Welcome back to our series on life. What is it? Now today we're going to get down to the nitty gritty and we are going to look at life and death. You know, we think about life a lot. We want to keep this life as long as possible. Some people try to do that by exercising, by eating right. Some people invest in products that are supposed to help improve their life or increase their lifespan. And other people, well, some people would be willing to even take the life of another person or persons if it meant they could keep their own life or the life of people they believe they're protecting. And some people, well, some people who are suffering from illnesses would endure torturous treatments just for the possibility of having a little bit longer on this earth to live. And truth be known, most of us don't really want to think about death. But somehow, life and death seem connected. We really believe that in order to get life, we have to escape death. And yet, it seems like death just pops up as a threat all the time even when we're trying to think of other things that are happy and good, there's always in the background this kind of noise that says death, death, death. And the unnerving thing about death is there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. It just can happen quickly, unexpectedly, and sometimes in ways we never even could figure out ourselves. So we feel like we constantly have to be on the lookout for death. Even when we're thinking of happy things, it's always there in our mind. It could come at any moment. There, it's just there. Now, here's the real question. If we think that heaven is so wonderful, and most of us think that it is, then why are we trying so hard to stay on earth? Well, the problem may be, that we do believe in heaven, but maybe we're not 100% sure that we are going there. Have you ever had those moments of doubt where you think, maybe I've overlooked something, and maybe it's a fatal mistake, and maybe I'm going to hell? And if that's the case from what we've heard about hell, we would much rather stay on earth. Well, there's, besides that, there's the other thought. What if there's really nothing after you die? What if it's really just the end? Game over. Nothing there. No going to the other side to see your friends and family. Just nothing ceasing to be. Well, any one of those thoughts can drive us right through anxiety and straight on to outright fear. And sometimes we have the thought, you know, if we could only talk to somebody who had really been all the way to the other side of death and could tell us what it's like and could just come back and tell us what to expect. Well, there doesn't seem to be anyone really like that. There are people who claim to have had near-death experiences, but that was only near-death not totally dead, but there was one person who did go all the way to the other side and came back, and that person was Jesus. Now, Jesus was truly dead. Jesus was beaten to a pulp. He was hung on a cross. He was really, in fact, dead. Lots of people saw it. Lots of people would agree with that, but then Jesus reappeared, not dead. He really came back, and again, people could attest to that because he hung around on the earth for 40 days before he beamed up into a cloud. And during that period of time, people talked to him, they ate with him, they touched him, they got all kinds of contact with him, and they wrote about it. So it really happened. But now there were some changes. It was recorded that there were things that were not quite like before Jesus died, before the resurrection. So afterwards, 
there's a question as to could people really recognize him? We have Mary, who knew Jesus very well, was one of his closest friends, and yet she didn't recognize him. We have the people on the walk to Emmaus who didn't recognize him. And there were other things. It appeared that Jesus could just appear. He could walk through walls. He could appear. He could disappear. And, of course, whenever he left the view of earth, he did rise up into the clouds. And so there were some things that were the same, but there were some things that were different. Now, why did Jesus have all of this happen so publicly? I mean, he could have just slipped away and people could have gossiped about what might have happened, but he actually had his dying, his coming back to the earth, his raising into the clouds. All of that was very public. Now, why would he want it like that? Well, he wanted there to be witnesses He wanted people to see it, to be able to talk to him, and to pass it on to other people, and to write about it, and to bring it on down from generation to generation, and write to us at this point in time. Now, why was that so important? Because Jesus did not want us to fear death. He was fulfilling one of the reasons that he came to earth. Lots of times if we ask people, why do you think Jesus came to earth? Well, we might get all kinds of answers like he came to save us from our sins and a variety of other things. But sometimes people overlook one of the key reasons that he came. He came to save us from the fear of death. Let's listen to how Paul described it in Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. He said, since the children have flesh and blood and the children is us, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And listen to this next part. Listen carefully. And free all those who all their lives were held in slavery. By what? By their fear of death. Now let's read that again so that you can hear it said as Jesus would say it to you. Jesus would tell you, since you have flesh and blood, I shared in your humanity so that by my death, I could break the power of the devil. He no longer has the power of death. He doesn't have that power over you, and I free you from being a slave to the fear of death. So today is your day to stop being afraid. When you give up the fear, when you stop clenching and hanging on, and you let your hands open and your heart and your mind open, then you can receive what it is that Jesus came to give you. And he said, besides getting rid of that fear of death, he wanted to give you something. He said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. So he doesn't want you to fear death and he wants you to have life and not just a plain old ordinary life. He wants you to have life to the full. So Jesus came to show us that the grave could not hold him and the grave can't hold us either. So now you might be saying, well, yeah, this was Jesus. Of course, the grave couldn't hold him. But me, well, he said very clearly, according to John 14, 19, he said, because I live, you also will live. You get that life to the full. You see, death is not the end of you. It's a change in your outer covering. Now let's look at some things in nature where we can actually see that happening. And you're going to see a trend here. It's like God is putting these lessons all around you. So when you take the skin off a banana, is it still a banana? 
Why, of course it is. In fact, taking the skin off lets us get to the best part. What about that caterpillar in the cocoon? When the caterpillar was in the cocoon, did the caterpillar die? No, he was changed. And he came out able to do things that he hadn't been able to do before. What about that chick in the egg? So when that shell came off the chick, was the chick dead? No, the chick had room to grow and the chick could go on and grow in a bigger life. Now, what about you? Did you die once you came out of the womb? No, it gave you room to grow and you kept growing. So you didn't die, you changed. Now, what happened to that baby that you used to be? What happened to that eight-year-old? What about that teenager? Did they all die? No, they changed. You simply changed and continued growing. So are you going to die when you shed your earthly body? No, you're going to change and you are going to keep growing. Now, if you're saying, I don't know, it still sounds kind of scary to lose any part of this physical body. Did you know that you have already died or changed multiple times in your life? There are between 50 and 75 trillion cells in your body. And every cell type has its own lifespan. In other words, it's expected that one will live longer than the other. There's a lifespan for your stomach or your intestines or your skin or any number of the parts of your body. And when they reach the end of that lifespan, they die off. Now, you have lost a lot of cells during the course of your body. Now, are you quick looking at yourself to see if you're disappearing? Because if you are, you're not. Because when those cells die off, they are replaced by new cells. You see, God didn't want you to have old, weak cells. He created your body in a way that you would have new things all along. When you grow out of your shoes, you try to get new ones. When you outgrow your skin, you get new skin. And even as you're listening to me right now, old skin cells are dying off and falling away. And new skin cells are underneath, right, ready to grow. And you see, God is taking care of that for you without you even knowing it. And he does that in multiple ways through your body. He doesn't even disturb you. He just carries on the work of your body. Now, you might also be interested to know that you participate in getting rid of the old and trusting that God is going to give you something new. I bet that you have, at some point in your life, cut your nails. You cut your fingernails, you cut your toenails, you cut your hair, or you let somebody do it. You were willing to let go of the old, and you trusted that God was going to grow new nails, new hair. You have already taken part in the body as God designed it, and you chose to let go of the old and trust God to bring the new. Now, this is what Paul says in Hebrews 8.15. Paul said what's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. He also said if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone. The new has come. So God sent you to earth in the bodily form that you have now. And he knew that you were going to use it for a certain time and then it would end. Now, when it's time for you to go to your next assignment, you're going to leave your old earth clothes, your work clothes, here on earth, your old body, and you're going to be given a new body, new clothes for your next assignment. Now, how are our bodies going to be any different from the bodies that we have now? Well, listen again to the way that Paul described it. Paul said there's heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. And he said each one has its own kind of glory. And he said the heavenly bodies, he said let's compare essentially the heavenly bodies and the earthly bodies. 
He said, with the resurrection of the dead, he said, what's sown perishable is raised imperishable. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. What's sown in weakness is raised in power. What's sown a natural body is raised a spiritual body. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 40 to 44. So we will get a different kind of body. The same as your body now is different from your baby body or your childhood body or your teenage body. Your heavenly body is going to be different from your earthly body. Now, are we going to get that new body gradually or all at once? Are we going to have to sleep in the grave until the end of time, just waiting for our new bodies to arrive? There are people that believe that, but I don't believe that. I believe that we will get our new bodies instantly. Jesus got his new body instantly. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, and he released his spirit, he got his spiritual body right then and there. Now, it wasn't discovered until the third day that there was really no one in that tomb, but Jesus, at the time, he said it's finished, and he released his body. He got his new heavenly body right then. Now, again, the words that Paul said say it very well. Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. You could just see Paul sitting there thinking, I can't even wrap my head around this. Paul said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Now, again, there are people that think that last trumpet is going to be at the end of time, and it will be the trumpet for everybody. But I believe that everybody gets their own trumpet fanfare just for them. So when the trumpet blows for you, you would be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Paul said the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. We shall be changed for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And Paul said, when that happens, then what had been said will really come true, that death is swallowed up in victory. Okay, so we get new bodies, but are we still going to look like ourselves? Well, which self? Um, The baby, the child, the teenager? The old person, um, who are we going to look like? What do we look like? Well, here's where we go back to the beginning. You were created in the image of God. You were made to look just like your creator. Now, a lot of things might have happened to you in your life that you forgot that. And when you look in the mirror, you don't see God. Or when other people look at you, perhaps they don't see God. But God's intent was that we would be able to say the same thing that Jesus said, which is anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. We were created to see, look just like him. Now, at the time of death, I'm believing that when we look at him, we are going to remember. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. And who knows, maybe those babies who can't talk yet Maybe they are seeing how they are truly created. We will discover with the earth clothes off that we do indeed look like God. Now let's see how John put it. John in 1 John 3, 2 said, Dear friends, we are children of God, and what we will be has yet to be known. In other words, when we say we are like him, We're not sure really what that looks like yet, but we do know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. So hopefully now, we've talked about a lot of things today, and hopefully you're feeling less frightened than you did before. And of course, I'd like you not to feel afraid at all of death. But maybe you might have just one question hanging on here. 
So before we go, we're going to address that question, which is, will I be afraid at the moment of death? Well, you have never been apart from God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You have been with them the entire time of your life, and you will always be with them. But you may not have felt their presence. I believe at the moment of death, you will feel their presence fully. You see, even though it's portrayed in some TV shows or movies, that angels might come along and take you to heaven. That may happen, but also we can be sure from what Jesus said that he himself will accompany you to heaven. So Jesus said, as recorded in John 14, 1 through 3, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you, and I'll come back and take you to be with me where I am. Jesus knows you. He is preparing your next stop specifically for you. And he's not just going to send somebody to come get you and take you there. He is so pleased and wants so much to be with you that he is going to be personally the one to escort you. Now, when you see him, I think you're going to experience more love, more joy, more peace than you have ever had in your whole life. And at that moment, you are going to see him more completely than you ever have before. All those questions you had will be answered in a moment because you're going to be in a place of fully knowing him, the same as he has fully known you all your life and probably will reveal to you then who you really are. So you'll understand what Paul meant when he put it this way. Paul said, now we see only a reflection in the mirror. When we look in the mirror, we just kind of see what we know staring back at us. But then Paul says, then we will see face to face. And what he meant by that is one day that mirror is just going to slide back and open, and instead of seeing what you thought was yourself, you will be looking at Jesus. You will be seeing Jesus. Paul said, now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. That was 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now, a lot of people try to put eternal life in terms of time. And Jesus didn't define it that way. Jesus didn't say, well, now there's the earthly life and then there's the eternal life. When he was talking with God, Jesus said this, it's recorded in John 17, 3. He said, now this is eternal life. He defined it. This, he said, is eternal life. That they know you, God, and the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So he said, it's all about knowing. So the more you know on earth of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, you are moving further along in the eternal life that you are already living now. When he said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full, that's the eternal life he was talking about having that life to the full and continuing to move and change and grow. Now, because of that, when you are standing in that presence, you will not even see death. Did you know that that is recorded? Jesus said, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Now, he didn't say death won't happen. But he said, you won't even know it. You won't even see it. You will see me. You will be in my presence and everything else will go to the back and you will not even see death. So what we should do now is live out our eternal life starting right now. Life to the full, life without being afraid of death and live the life to the full. 
And when Jesus says it's time to change in that twinkling of an eye, when you hear that trumpet and when you see Jesus, then you will step into the next life and you will live it even fuller. I'm Carolyn Priester-Jones, and I'm so glad you decided to join us for this exciting journey. I'm looking forward to seeing you next time.